Hello everyone and welcome to the online lit collective with Sponge and Subdin. Um, we're coming to you live from New Zealand and Australia and other places in the world and uh, we've got some live work for you to hear tonight. So uh, first up is, well I'm just going to introduce each person in turn and they're going to tell um, you a little bit about themselves and then they're going to perform their piece. So first up is Gail Ingram, right here. <laughs> Hello, I'm Gail Ingram, and I'm reading uh, my poem called A Second Probe, and it was published on the inaugural issue of Sponge magazine, of which Lucy Jane is the editor. And so thank you, Lucy Jane. And you can find more of my poetry at www.theseventhletter.nz, which the seventh letter is for G. G for Gale. <laughs> so here's my poem from New Zealand, Christchurch. <laughs> Second probe. I lie on crisp sheets, eagle spread thighs like meat, waiting for hook teeth or a cold speculum to trawl my insides. His hands are fish, he rings to warm, though I know from previous experience they won't be. His face is pop dimpled like a corn chip. His mouth opens to speak, da, 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 da. This is what I hear. Doritos, Doritos. That ad they beamed to outer space, somewhere near Ursa Major in 2008. Which makes me think of another major. We are floating in. May God's love be with you. Da, 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 da. He flashes his teeth, a smile. Oh, oh, the penetration is sweet. What did those aliens think of corn crisps dancing around a salsa bowl, preparing joyfully to be eaten? Did they wonder at the crunch, the squeal of palm oil heat? Were they... Hungry. I wish you'd shut up so we of Ursa Major can get on with it. It's only when we're in we'll be consumed by the marvels of our feats, the things we can explore. Da, 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 those polyps, for instance. This beautiful cavern, oh, and thank you for clearing those pesky trees and orangutans and tigers. A great start for a colony. What progress. I'm hearing the sound, e Dorito, it doesn't hurt, e to be brave, and what should I expect anyway if the waves I send are distracting? It's not our first meeting, I know, I arranged it for my own sake, but I wonder, Did the Māori warriors giggle the first time they saw the blood river at the back 
of their merchant's head. Or perhaps it was the clean white savage with the smoking musket who smiled at the surprise on Hemi's face. These days, the collection of a mere few cells, da da da, is the best way to tell if you are sick. Besides, we like your ships. That was Gail Ingram. Thanks, Gail. Um, next up, we have Alex Stronach. Yes, sorry, coming to you from the beautiful and sunny city of Wellington, uh, where the wind never blows. And well, it's Halloween tomorrow, so I thought I'd give you something a little bit spooky. Uh, it is set in a sausage factory. Uh, if that is a problem, tune out for about six minutes. I'd like to thank Tim Kenwood, who made this lovely graphic that's behind me, and Sebastian Morgan Winter on the cello, who you can hear celloing away. Uh, behind the camera. Here we go. Ten seconds ago, it had been a sausage. Now it was a single human hand, neatly sheared off at the wrist. Jono had been fixing some wiring issue when the whole sausage machine started pumping backwards. The sausages on the line went in, and squealing beasts came out. The lads on the line were having a whale of a time putting sausages in and laughing as whole pigs came out, mad, rolling eyes all <laughs> and charged off the belts until they could be captured and killed and fed back into the machine. The men went forwards and backwards with the same pig for about 20 minutes, laughing the whole time. Then they started putting in other meat from around the factory and it all went to hell. What 10 seconds ago had been a pack of Mrs. Popper's London garlic pork bratwurst was a man's pale, shriveled hand. It had a single ring on one of the fingers and set with a red stone. The building was immediately scoured for other London brats to put through a machine. Nobody was particularly enthusiastic, but it had to be done. It didn't take long for them to find more. Four human toes without a foot. This little piggy went to market. This little piggy went home. This little piggy got butchered. This little piggy got bone. Two toes were dark skinned. A third had red nail polish and a fourth was covered in a layer of thick hair. Should call the cops, said Jono. He smoked. But I suppose they'd be more worried about the pigs, wouldn't they? His family, that is. They all shook their heads. A few of them moved towards the machine, then stopped, then moved again, then stopped, then moved again. Everybody was looking at them and the machine, and them at the machine, and them at the machine. The men stuttered around the factory floor every few seconds, then everyone and everything came to a halt. The foreman decided it needed to be done right. Gibbo found a clipboard and took notes. Invented it here with results of putting Mrs. Popper's real authentic London garlic pork bratwurst sausage product through the mincing machine backwards, with which Mr. Jonathan John Specker has tempered to produce an unusual effect. Five whole pigs alive, later returned to sausage state by machine. Three human feet, devoid of toes, dead. One human eyeball, brown, dead. One human head, holy shit. The head was screaming, I'm no snitch, I'm no snitch, I'm no snitch. It had no teeth. No time and was missing an eye. It had been roughly severed, almost as if it had been torn off with tremendous force at the neck, and this didn't appear to affect its vitality in the slightest. Now, the men from the freezing works were made of Cerner stuff and carefully put the head aside with the other, um, things. After some consideration, somebody stuck a piece of tape over its mouth. Please note, all previously detached human products resulting from the machine are now considered alive until further information has been made available to us. It was decided that Mr. Lombardi, who was given all hours access to the machine, on his request and granted to his position as primary shareholder, is to be barred access to the machine until further information can be attained. 
and is also a very un-Christian language previously used in the document, which was deployed due to the arisal of a surprising circumstance. What if, said John, we get a whole bunch of these parts and put them through together? At this juncture, a vote was taken on Mr. Specter's suggestion, which was agreed unanimously by the factory employees and the relative union relevant union representative. It was realized by the employees that more human parts would need to be produced before the suggestion could be undertaken, and more sausages were retrieved for this precise purpose. The law continues. One human head, alive. One whole pig, alive, later returned to sausage state by a machine. Three human torsos, alive. Six human arms, alive. Five human legs, alive. 17 human hands alive. At this juncture, work was postponed while the products were sorted out. The hands were everywhere, scattering around the room like little spiders were women smashed with shovels and wrenches and any damn heavy thing they could find. Several hands mopped the foreman and tore his skin, gouged his eyes. He screamed and staggered around, guided towards the conveyor belt. The hands dragged him in and he screamed and he came out as approximately 18, 82.5 kilograms of Mrs. Popper's real authentic garlic for bratwurst sauce product in the little piles. Somebody fought their way through the blizzard of dismembered body parts to hit the reverse switch and the foreman came back out in pretty much the same condition as before, still screaming plus or minus a couple of hands. An incident occurred. At this juncture, the foreman was given one cup of tea to calm his nerves. Mr. William Lynch was sent for pies at 11.30 a.m. precisely and as of 1.14 p.m. has not returned. His cellular phone was called, and he said he was quite all right, but needed half a day off, as he had a cold. Half day granted. They took inventory of the parts they had. They came from men and women of every size, age, race, somewhere in the states of greater decay, but some were plump and fresh. 30 people at least, over the span of several years. Mr. Lombardi had been up to mischief, and no mistake. The men took the parts and placed them on the conveyor belt. Somebody was praying and somebody else was swearing. John had stood the controls waiting for the all clear. The union rep gave the nod. John had hit the switch and the thing chugged to life. One human alive. After this juncture, another incident occurred. The beast lurched off the conveyor belt and fell to the floor, screaming on its hands and knees. Large patches of skin were missing entirely. One leg was far too short. One eye was far too mad. Hair stuck out at odd angles, jutting out between wads of scar tissue. I'm no snitch, I'm no snitch, it bellowed and lunged at Jono, grabbing him around the throat with both hands and a couple more hands. Vertebrae twisted and smashed together. It screamed, it shook his body like a child with a doll. Jono's head flopped back and forth with a grating of bone on bone. Two men grabbed the creature by its arms. It wailed and snarled in bits as they fed it back on the machine. It shook from the inside and there was a tearing of metal. Every man held his breath until the noises stopped and the body parts were on the inside. They fed them through again just for good measure. About 50 kg of sausages sat on the belt. Tell you what, said the foreman, I'm never eating meat again. Thank you. Thanks, Alex, that was great. Next up, we have Emily Crocker. Hello. <laughs> Evening, I'm Emily Crocker. I'm also appearing with Jay Bailey. Uh, on guitar, we'd both like to acknowledge that we're performing for you now on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, or what you might have heard referred to as Sydney. Um, I'm going to read some poems from this chapbook, Girls and Boyant, that the lovely people at Sub Din recently released. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to start with a little one called Wool. There's not much we can do about the ocean. She said it, wearing a wool sweater, those carnivorous teeth curling as if a herd of cattle would stop for her. By which she meant, you can't have a revolution without people dying. And a uh, resolution. Look at these people, jogging on January 4th, 
They must hate themselves. They must. They must hate the fluorescent sneakers made from recycled sea junk and made by slaves. They must. And they must hate their bright complexion as much as their white teeth and their expensive headphones. They must hate the sun, illuminating their radiant taut legs, flogging into the pavement. The grinding of cartilage, the stretch and spring of muscles glowing out of their limbs in heavy lumps, they must hate themselves. They must. They must hate themselves as I hate the morning, stuck in my eye, tumbling onto the bus, somehow both hung over and employed. And pinned. The sunflowers know full well that they are sunflowers. Cellophane spun with their smiles pinned back as friends and family rumble past from hospital reception to cock the stems of their necks at the elevator directory. The florist asks if they need any help there, having squeaked around the corridors enough times waiting, forked tongue behind teeth for the two young men to say they're visiting their sister in maternity. She'll spit out a grand symphony of baby's breath and carnations. A teddy bear laced down in the center of it all, only $80, and she'll give me a foil balloon for free. Was it a boy or a girl? Too bad the sunflowers don't know what the sun is anymore. Desperately synthesizing bleach and neon, the gold knives of petals. Too proud now for soil lean back in their flashy new ride. I stir sucralose into my paper cup coffee. I check the time and wonder what kind of boutonniere would look best pinned to a straight jacket. Uh, and this is uh, called Covers. Dug within the queen-sized sheets, Drooping overboard our double bed. I first thought of my hermit crab who, when I was eight, buried herself under the sawdust in one corner of her tank and never crawled back out. All I had to offer was shitty ginger-flavored chamomile tea, half a foil of ibuprofen and guilt-laden reparations for greeting you this evening with, why the fuck is the sink covered in noodles? My stomach Thudding into your silence, your battery pig recoil at the bedroom light switched on. I dared to think we couldn't afford the Ambo bill if you sunk any deeper. My car it still sounds like a washing machine. I reach through the stink of tea tree and dog's ears to coyly prize open your hand. Pinky promised me you won't die tonight. You shook my little finger back. I put the car keys on the bedside anyway and held your cells, rocking themselves together until the pharmacy reopened. All right, we just have one more for you. It's called Catalog. Uh, and my blessings to all of the retail workers uh, in the lead up to Christmas. Mailbox regurgitating catalogs. Neighbor, I don't know if you've boarded yourself in against the avalanche, waiting for the merchant's tables to be thrown, or if you're just not home. We left a candy cane on your door handle anyway, best before November, work was chucking them out. Under the damp blanket of night, flushed by fairy lights, neon blue blaring. Happy holidays! Don't shoot up in front of my garage. We scamper to the next house with free sack cream, bubblegum flavored and dyed green, while a woman watches us not touch her Mazda 4, nylon lashes scratching the screen door and the intermittent glow of novelty light up Rudolph nose earrings warning out as glitter lays its eggs in the carpet at her feet. I'm sure, I'm sure I'll see her again on the 27th. Sheath of receipts in hand, rote learned returns policy, and a scrunched plastic bag from a different store of shit. No one wants. 
until the January sales kick in. Thanks so much. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Emily. Uh, next, we have Alison Gallagher. Uh, hey, all. Uh, my name is Alison. Um, I would also like to acknowledge that uh, I'm reading on the land of the Gadigal people of the UR Nation. Um, its sovereignty was never ceded. Um, I'm going to be reading from this little book that Subdin also put out, um, and uh, yeah, this one, uh, this first one is called Vey. Imagining myself as a sketch of a person, messy strokes around a vague outline. The details fill out when you kiss the space between my neck and collarbone. They fade when the woman at the grocery store asks if that will be all today, sir. I'm tired of feeling broken by language when it is the only safe place I've ever known. Wrapping myself up in its coat to feel secure, digging its fingernails into my skin to feel held, surviving on the promise that some elusive cryptographic combination could make things right, uh, that I could articulate the things words don't exist for yet, how having a body is exhausting. The problem is that I'm a woman trapped in a man's body when the problem is more like I'm trapped in a body. To become is to break yourself apart. I remind myself each time I leave the house, it's supposed to hurt this much. That is that one. Um, this one is called Surf's Up. <clears throat> right now, I'm a dog wearing sunglasses. More specifically, I'm a dog wearing sunglasses on a surfboard. I'm a dog wearing sunglasses on a surfboard, wearing a leather jacket. I'm a dog wearing sunglasses, wearing a leather surfboard, riding a wave of disappointment. I'm a dog wearing disappointment. I'm the wave, I'm a disappointed dog, and there's nothing sadder on this earth than a disappointed dog. Last night, your new girlfriend saw me at the grocery store buying a large bag of Doritos for myself and a salsa jar that said, great for parties, which also was for myself. It was weird. It could have been a party if we'd eaten it together, but uh, instead we just pretended not to see each other. Now it's later and I'm a surfboard wearing a leather jacket. I'm a surfboard riding a wave of leather jackets to be eaten by sharks who have no idea how cool they might look wearing a leather disappointment. I'm a dog wearing a leather shark. This morning we went to the beach and I asked what you're hopeful for and you said that you were hopeful because you met me. Unfortunately, I'm a disappointment wearing sunglasses. I'm a dog wearing sunglasses. That is that one. This one's called World Champion. When I spend days in a bathtub, I'm the most capable person in this room. I'm giving a well-attended TED talk on achieving just the right water temperature. I'm the Metallica of eating at least one slice of toast a day and the Tony Hawk of remembering to take my medication. When I spend days in a bathtub, I graciously accept award nominations for not driving off a cliff this week. I'm the foremost scholar on not stuffing my mouth full of sleeping pills. I'm this week's cover star of Not Dying magazine. When I spend days in a bathtub, I'm the world champion of not killing myself, which is enough accolade to survive. Cool. Um, I'm, I'm going to read one more. Um, which is not from the book. Uh, given the um, digital nature of the event, I thought it would be quite apt to read a poem about internet crushes. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do. Fall in love or anything stupid like that. I know it's 2017 and that's not really having, that's not really how it works. Having access to each other's secret Instagrams is probably enough. 
sexting you right now from inside a liquor store that's blasting a dance remix of In The End by Linkin Park. It feels weird on multiple levels. This morning, I watched a woman prevent a complete stranger from falling on the bus and thought about how much capacity we have in every infinitely small moment to hold each other up. All I want is to hold people up, like tree trunks instead of weird fleshy jelly snakes. Wish my hands were less like earthquakes. Wish I didn't apologize so much for my body. I can't believe it's another beautiful sunny day here on avoiding my feelings forever island. Worrying is a cute date idea. Regret is also a good one. I keep seeing men who are stoic and emotionally unavailable and being like, grow up already. I keep seeing women who are stoic and emotionally unavailable and being like, please ruin my life already. The time in your city for the sixth time this week. We don't have to fall in love or anything stupid like that. That's me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alison. Next, we have Aisha Sher Edel. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me, by the way, DWF. This is a really awesome opportunity that you guys have for emerging writers. Um, so today I have three poems to read. The first one is titled Sea Turtle Patrol. And it's exactly, it's about exactly what it sounds like. It's about when I was very lucky, very, very lucky to be um, a sea turtle patroller in Costa Rica. Sea Turtle Patrol. We have been walking for hours. When I remember the fatigue of that night, I think of how desperately I dove into oblivion. How I wished my aching legs far, far away. Far away from this black and craggy beach. Our torches to light a warm bed instead of looming old twists of trees. I remember being so afraid of quicksand as a child, but looking back on it, maybe a fear of average sprawling sand was more reasonable because around me, these waves crash like cars, like collisions, like the bellow of thunder. They peel away the shore with intent. And if the sea is not alive, it does a really good job of faking it. I'm ready to cry, to collapse, to attack. We stop instead. In front of us, in mossy scoots, patient across the swash and the crested bone, through the mud, to the incline, to the yellow fan, staggers a huge and magnificent sea turtle. She hunkers down, closes her great eyes, and with the guide's single beckon, we crowd in giddy whispers and fascinated stares. I reach out to touch her back. I do it again, because I'm literally touching the sea turtle. Next to me, someone begins to cry. In our photographs, the, title, the turtle is luminous and calm, filled with an old blind wish, unquestioned and encompassing. Um, the next poem is titled Progress. Uh, so this poem is very near and dear to my heart. Um, one of the themes of the, of the book, oh sorry, I forgot to say that subbed in, um, published out of my books, one published a book of mine. Um, but this poem is sort of about my journey in mental health to self-compassion and gratitude and sort of being kinder to myself. Progress. Rain becomes a seagull, looping at your shoulder and instead flies off to saltier seas and blow french fries, where perfection becomes a painting lauded by some or despised by others, and you, the viewer, separate from it. Where the measure of a face lies not in how much desire it stirs in a stranger, but in its gracious bend, its loving smile, its giving hand. 
and I coveted not for its colour, but for its capacity to forgive, a spirit unbound by a hard body. Because maybe difficulty will not always turn into pain, pain into suffering, suffering into mistake. Out here, the days are long and wide. What a pity to spend them wishing they were not. Um, and finally, my last poem is titled Rosales, 2016. And Rosales was this um, really beautiful place I visited in Spain. And um, I met some really amazing people there and they were the inspiration for this poem. Under those is your silks. We did not wish for music, but still, rain came. Palm to loving palm, we repeat ancient words echoed by the muscled boom of thunder. A mother cat, exhausted, licks her newborn kittens clean. We gather and crew over her wrinkled little pockets of fur. A circular minaret twines upwards, and I scurry there to listen to you. The wind tugs my heart forward, like a hinge. If not for this, I'm as good as dead. Thankfully, I open. Thankfully, I listen. You have never lost me, but what a joy it is to be found. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Aisha. That brings us to the end of our online lit collectives. Um, but before we go, I'm just gonna open it, the floor up to um, the artists in case there is anything that they would like to just um, let you guys know before we kind of head off. Um, so yeah, does anyone have anything they would like to say? I'd like to thank my um, man on keyboards, <laughs> Mark. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, it's been a real <laughs> pleasure. An awesome job. <laughs> Super fun. Yeah. And thank you to the um, organisers. Great opportunity. Yeah. Um, I just um, like, I just like to I just like to say that if you want to buy any of Emily's, on a copy of Emily's book or a copy of Alison's book or a copy of some of my poems. They're all available online on subdin.bigcartel.com. These guys are really, really amazing poets and like you really, really need to check them out. So that's my piece. And I'd just like to say that um, if anybody has any amazing sci-fi stories or poetry or would like to read them, then um, please visit sponge.nz. Uh, we are going to be opening up to Australian writers soon, so I would love to see some works come in. But we're also open to New Zealand and Pacific writers as well. Well, without further ado, I will uh, let end this here and just say thank you so much to everyone who came along and to the Digital Writers Festival as well. Good night, everyone. Bye. 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 <laughs>